with us today as our presenter. Um, so before we get started, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. So today's webinar is being recorded um, and the slides will be available for download as well as the recording will be available on the MCTAC website. So please check that out if you'd like to reference the slides after today's presentation. Um, we've set about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, but do feel free to use the chat box throughout the presentation and type in your questions to all panelists. Um, you know, if there's something that comes up during the presentation, we'd be happy to address it um, on the spot. And we can also wait till the end to address people's questions. So just a little bit about MCTAC. MCTAC is a training, consultation, and educational resource center that offers resources to all mental health and substance use disorder providers in New York State uh, with the overall goal of preparing and assisting providers with the transition to Medicaid-managed care. And here are our CTAC and MCTAC partners. And uh, today's webinar is a Small Business Initiative Partner webinar, so here are Small Business Initiative Partners. And for folks that aren't too familiar with that, the Small Business Initiative um, is basically a subset of MCTAC that um, provides, provides training and consultation and resources um, to providers transitioning to Medicaid managed care that have little or maybe less experience or no experience um, billing Medicaid. So a little bit about our presenter today. Um, Matt Rusa is the Director of Planning and Quality Improvement for the Onondaga County Department of Adult and Long-Term Services. And they offer a plethora of uh, behavioral mental health services there. Matt also does some teaching um, in addition to maintaining a private practice. He also works as a consultant, trainer, and coach, providing organizational and systems level support um, for program development, quality improvement, and strategic planning. So we're so happy that he's with us today and he's taking time out of his busy schedule to uh, present today. So just a reminder, again, before we get started, please do use the chat box throughout the presentation as questions come up um, and type your questions into all panelists. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna advance the next slide for you, Matt, and pass over the presenter ball to you. Okay. Great. So we'll all right, thanks. Appreciate the intro, Daniela. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk with you about these issues. Um, we're going to have, as you see the agenda, the core uh, kind of meat of our conversation is going to be rooted around the Plan, Do, Study, Act approach. Some of you are familiar with PDSA. Some people call it Plan, Do, Check, Act. We'll get into that a little bit in terms of those different names. Um, and uh, But also the things that go along with that, some of the tools that you need in order to do that process, some of the things that you need to get rolling with this kind of quality improvement work. So um, as I will reiterate what Daniela said, if you do have some burning questions that are really critical during the course of the conversation, go ahead and, and plug those in. We'll take a look at those. Uh, monitor those as we go through, and of course, we'll save some time at the end of our conversation to uh, make sure that we can uh, have a chat with you about any questions that remain at the end. So this is kind of a compass, if you will, for the core way that I like to think about PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act. Really, you have the pre-change steps and the post-change steps on the on the top and the bottom, kind of like the, the bun or the bread, if you will, and then the meat of the sandwich is that PDSA in the center. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the ways that organizations choose goals, think about what they might need to change and measure. That's really critical because a lot of organizations are really interested in trying to do rapid cycle change. Most organizations at this stage of the game are well aware of the need to move away from traditional old school quality improvement where they might start a project and do it for a year and at the end of the year kind of look at some numbers and see whether or not it was successful. Most of us know that we don't have a year to waste on something that's not working for us. So most of you are aware you want to try to get accurate, rapid information about whether or not a change that you've implemented is effective for you. And so a lot of folks just kind of launch into some quick changes without really setting them up. There's a little bit of a need to make sure that you do some, some strategic efforts on the front end to make sure that the changes that you implement are likely to be successful for you and that they're targeted appropriately uh, so that they're intentional and, and focused. 
So we'll talk about some of those tools. My hope is that you will look at the things that we're going to be discussing during this webinar, and then they, you'll go ahead and try some of them. You don't need to go take a course in these things. You don't need to sign on for a very expensive uh, training seminar or a week at, at, at whatever institute to, to learn these tools. Not that those would be a, a bad idea, but most of us don't have the resources to do those things. All of the, the tools that I'm going to be sharing with you today are readily accessible. You can Google any of them and find plenty of information. You can also contact me if you have interest in further information. Uh, so they're out there, and some of them will be very familiar to you, some of them less so. But I'm going to talk through a few of the core tools that I think are very effective and helpful uh, in, uh, in working on this, this effort, uh, this quality improvement, process improvement work. So first category we want to talk about today, choosing goals. How do, you define, how do we define what we want to change or improve and some tools that we can use to plan our goals and the change to achieve them? So we want to think about some specific things that we might do in order to think about what our goals should be, could be, and then to look at what we might want to change as an organization to improve our services. Some of these are pretty familiar with you, for you. Uh, some of the, m one of the things I'm really interested in is a lot of folks are familiar with these categories like environmental scan. That's a phrase that everybody uses all the time. Um, but a lot of times when people do environmental scans, they don't cover the waterfront, so to speak. They don't really kind of categorize it and thoughtfully look through some key categories. They just kind of do a rapid fire, hey, what's going on out there? What do we need to pay attention to? which is somewhat useful, but what's a lot more useful is to think about this kind of a simple grid. I'm a fan of simple grids like this, which create some boxes that you need to attend to. And here we have eight boxes. So a really good environmental scan means that you're going to take a look at these eight boxes. So both at the macro level, national uh, or state level, and then at the micro level in your local community or in your specific industry. Uh, and then across these four trend areas, social demographic, economic, political, technological. So a nice solid environmental scan means that you and your team take a look across these eight categories and really try to generate some solid content in each of those boxes. You know, what's going on for us? What's going on that's going to impact us? You know, everyone right now at the national level is talking about the Affordable Care Act and repeal or not repeal, and uh, it looks like the most recent efforts kind of went downhill for the Republicans today. What's going to happen next week? I mean, there's some huge national trends that are very relevant to all of us in healthcare and behavioral health care. And then, of course, some local trends, what's going on in terms of your political environment in your town, county, uh, region of the state, et cetera. So looking through these eight categories, really trying to do some strong work and, and asking the question to all your key stakeholders, any one of you as an individual is not going to probably be able to thoughtfully cover all eight of these boxes. But you do have stakeholders on your board, uh, organizations of which you're a member, uh, state associations uh, who can provide you with this kind of information, uh, other staff members who have different uh, perspectives and visions that can help you to really do a nice job with this. So that's environmental scan. Also SWOT analysis. We'll start with SWOT and then we'll talk a little bit about SOAR. These are all excellent ways and these are kind of classic strategic planning kinds of tools that get you toward focusing on some clear goals. Again, when people think about SWAT, they get the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Something that some folks tend to forget is that these are really divided into two categories, this top column of internal elements and this bottom, uh, excuse me, this top row of internal and this bottom row of, of external. So internal strengths and weaknesses, what's going on within our organization that is a strength, within our organization that is a weakness thinking about generating ideas related to those two boxes, and then looking outside, right? So opportunities and threats really are things that exist outside of the organization. Intuitively, the language would lead one to think about external, but I've seen a lot of organizations kind of overlap these categories where they, they're thinking about opportunities and they're, they're talking about things that are internal or they're thinking about threats and talking about things that are internal. I think it's really important to make that distinction between what is internal to our organization that is a positive or a negative, a strength or weakness, what is external that is an opportunity or threat. 
and to spend some time, again, similar to the environmental scan, to work through this with a team. You'll hear me say team over and over probably because I'm a huge fan of doing these things uh, through a team process, and I'll wrap us up probably talking a little bit about some team elements. Uh, I always, when I'm working consulting or working within my county role uh, with organizations, really stress the need for a diverse team with stakeholders from a range of positions and orientations within an organization to be able to be effective. Unfortunately, a lot of quality improvement planning, a lot of strategic planning happens with an executive level team with senior management or maybe some senior board leadership, but is not inclusive of the broad stakeholder pool. And as a result, it's a far weaker team because it lacks uh, the, uh, the vision and orientation of those other, other key stakeholders. So, um, so think about when you're working on any of these tools, making sure that you engage a team that is broad in its vision and its perspective and in its roles to be able to be most efficient. I'd mentioned that uh, there was a, a, a it, it, on the previous slide it said uh, SWAT slash SOAR. SOAR is an alternative to SWAT, which comes from the, from the Appreciative Inquiry School of Thinking, which is more of a strength-based orientation to SWAT. Some folks really find the SWAT to work and they're, they're, they like to be able to dig in on the, the weaknesses and threats. Other folks find that that can be a little bit demoralizing with their teams or with their groups and they'd rather use more of a strength-based approach. I, I like SOAR, I think it's excellent, and so it's a nice alternative. So uh, when we're talking about SOAR, the acronym is Strengths, Opportunities, Aspirations, Results. Some folks will look at that and say, well, what about those weaknesses and threats? My experience is that when you look at these four categories, these SOAR categories, those weaknesses and threats issues tend to show up. They, they are entered into the conversation as soon as you start talking about opportunities, strengths, aspirations, people will also say, yeah, but there's this or there's something in our way or how are we going to address this challenge related to that? And then we look at the weaknesses, threats, issues. So my encouragement is you can use the standard swap if you find that those weaknesses and threats tend to be a little demoralizing for your team, then you might want to think about these, these, the SOAR approach or to take a look at some of the uh, appreciative inquiry literature that's out there. Uh, some of these questions, I think, are particularly powerful in motivating and focusing a team. What makes us proud? How do we make sense of the opportunities? What do we care deeply about? Um, lots of times we don't spend enough of our energy focusing on those kinds of uh, emotional and, and compelling questions that can really motivate and focus a team. Uh, as we know in our work, in our industry, we have a hugely uh, mission-based uh, staff. And so when we talk about these kinds of questions, they can often really compel and, and, and appeal to uh, that, that, that mission-based approach that our staff does have. So I would strongly encourage exploring some of these SOAR ideas. They're pretty effective. Another piece that's nice on the front end is cause and effect diagrams. They're also called fishbone diagrams. If you see that uh, graphic on the right, it looks like a fishbone, and so that's why it gets called that. It's also called Ishikawa diagram based on the, the, the originator of this particular model. So along with the uh, environmental scan, SWAT and SOAR, trying to find the root cause of things to try to understand what your goals should be and what you might need to change, very simple and very effective strategies to do a cause and effect diagram. We simply start with a problem, uh, stating a specific problem. Maybe the problem might be, well, people aren't showing up for appointments in our service. Um, and then we start to ask questions. Why does that happen? And I like to draw it just as a simple circle toward the left here. Just make a circle in the middle of the page and state the problem around the board or wherever you're doing this. And then we have these dark blue circles coming off of it, which would be our primary causes. So if people aren't showing up for appointments, the primary cause might be um, they forgot. Uh, and so then off of each or another primary cause might be um, they didn't have transportation. Uh, you could have multiple reasons why a person might not show up for appointments. And so then uh, with each of those primary causes, we then keep asking, why does that happen? Well, why is it that people forget? Well, they have a lot going on in their lives. Their lives are stressful and challenging. Or maybe they don't have a calendar or maybe they're not used to scheduling appointments because that, that's not the norm for how they might receive other services in their life. So you get the picture here. You can just keep looking at 
a primary, secondary, tertiary causes and track your way to the more root causes. So rather than saying our problem is people aren't showing up, it might be our problem is people have no way to get to care or our problem is we're uh, asking folks to, uh, to receive a service in a way that's not familiar to them. And that's a much more actionable problem in terms of thinking about your goals and then strategies that you would develop in order to improve uh, your ability to deliver the service effectively. So hopefully you can see how you can get together with a group of folks and put this up on a big piece of paper and generate a whole bunch of ideas and all those outer circle outer circles of causes, any one of those could then generate a bunch of strategies for potential changes that might uh, impact your service in a very positive way. So that's the, uh, the cause and effect diagram. Very useful, very simple, very easy to use. I also want to talk with you about a walk, the walkthrough, which has uh, been around for a long time. It's a simple role play where you, uh, you know, kind of walk a mile in the shoes of your service recipients. Uh, you take on the role of, a, of an individual. You see a few bullets there in terms of how I encourage people to do walkthroughs. My recommendation is that you have two people do it together. That way they can kind of process it and they usually tend to gather more information when there's two folks, two sets of eyes and ears involved with the process. You have them walk through a piece of the process. Maybe it's how people come into your service system. Maybe it's how people are admitted or engaged in services or how you uh, move them through the paperwork process or, or whatever it might be. So you plan that out ahead of time and then you stay in your role as though you're a recipient of the service and you take notes as you're having the experience. My encouragement is to focus on the emotional experience. Uh, for example, I've done walkthroughs with services that I was familiar with, but I stayed in my role and I you know, went to the appointment and went up to the building and realized that the signage on the building really didn't tell me how to get into the building. Um, there were two different buzzers on the door. One seemed to be uh, I wasn't sure if one was uh, some sort of a uh, system for me to contact people in the building or one was a door uh, bell or it was just kind of confusing. Now I'd been in that building many times before and I knew how to get in the building obviously, but for, through the eyes of this walkthrough I was able to see that the signage and the, the kind of engaging, um, the messaging on the front of the building was just inadequate. So it left people with, uh, it was not a welcoming uh, experience when I first walked into the building. That's just one of dozens of, of, of examples that I could give you in terms of the kinds of things that you experience when you do a role play like that. And in the blue box you'll see a couple of key questions that I think are really critical. Each time you, as you're walking through the process, you ask with each step, is this step needed? Many times we have redundant steps in our process that are not needed. And is this step the best that it can be? So if you define it as necessary and important, a particular way that you work with folks, um, if it is, then is it the best that it can be? And again, now we're generating lots of uh, potential change uh, options for us. So then we can look at strategies for how we can make that step better to improve the service, to improve our ability to engage folks and to make sure our customer service is what it, what it should be. So that's the walkthrough, very popular. Um, usually takes a little bit of time to plan. One of the biggest uh, challenges with walkthroughs is having everybody stay in their role. Lots of times staff will, you know, will, will work with the person doing the walkthrough and then instead of doing the process, they'll start saying things like, well, next I would do this and next I would do that and that's not a walkthrough. We want them to actually do the process. I'm also distinguishing this from a secret shopper routine. A lot of you are familiar with secret shoppers where maybe you call up your intake center and kind of find out how people treat you on the phone. I'm not a huge fan of secret shoppers uh, uh, because they lead to the gotcha moment with staff where folks uh, might not be uh, functioning at their, at their optimal level and then you may have some trust challenges there. The counter argument to my position often is, yeah, but if we tell them we're going to do the walkthrough, then they'll be, at the, they'll be on their best behavior and it really doesn't represent um, the actual service, the, the typical service. My suggestion is it'll be typical enough and even under the best of circumstances, there will be plenty of things that you'll notice that are actionable that you can then use to uh, consider strategies for improving your service. And then you're doing it without any of those gotcha issues and it doesn't detract from a sense of, of team and teamwork. So my recommendation, make sure everybody's fully aware of the process 
and that they stay in role, and then you can work together. The staff can then be a part of the conversation when you're saying, well, yeah, this part didn't go so well, or this part was kind of challenging, or I didn't really, I was a little stressed out by that part. Let's figure out how we can make that better. Again, then leading to a lot of potential quality improvement strategies that you can employ at that point. So let's talk about flowcharts. A lot of you are familiar with flowcharts. You've seen them before. Another great strategy for figuring out what you want to change. As you may have seen, there can be extremely complicated strategies for employing flowcharts. If you looked in other industries in particular, you'll see some uh, a wide range of symbols that people use. I like to keep this super, super stripped down, very simple. And, and the way that I typically do flowcharts flow with organizations is to start at the top of a big piece of paper and put the first step, then go to the bottom of the paper and put the last step. Those are those blue boxes and then start filling in the steps in between. You know, what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And then there's the arrows in between each of those steps. And so we have the steps and all the transitions in between them. And then once we have what we think is a pretty decent map of how the flow goes, we then take a look at some of the flaws and challenges. And as you'll notice, if you think about some of these past tools that we've been looking at and this current tool, you can start to see how these things can work together. For example, we do a walkthrough, and then after having the experience, we sit down and we flow chart it, and then we have had some um, anecdotes from our own experience that we can think about in terms of flaws that we can make note of on this flow chart, and we can ask our staff what they're thinking some of the flaws might be, and then we can start to have with those red arrows, the corresponding fixes with the green arrows, which is, again, another way to start to get at some of these challenges. Again, if you did this, again, also in combination um, with the Ishikawa diagram that we had up there first, where we were thinking about root causes, we might then add that piece of information into this mix. So you can see how these, these tools can kind of start to coordinate with each other and give you a really strong sense of what's going on in terms of areas for possible improvement for you. So flow charting, again, keeping it simple, avoiding complexity, and doing this with the team, having it up on the board so people can take a look at the flow sometimes allows your staff to have insights and awareness that they have never had before about the nature of the services that you're providing. Okay, the next piece I want to talk about with you is nominal group technique. Most of you have been involved in some form of brainstorming, probably all of you. Sometimes it's not formally called brainstorming, but it's just a bunch of people saying, hey, let's think about this. Anybody have any ideas about how to change something or fix something? Or, um, so we've all done brainstorming. And um, frankly, from my experience, most brainstorming is um, ineffective in some pretty important ways. Uh, you'll see on the left-hand column a list of some elements of good brainstorming. It's structured and facilitated by a leader, focused on specific questions, including includes all the participants, encourages all ideas, engages individuals in a team effort, generates a wide range of new ideas. Most of us at first blush would say, yeah, the brainstorming we do does that, but I tend to take a pretty critical look at brainstorming because I think it's a very important process. And much of what we think of as effective brainstorming is not particularly effective because it typically is a free-for-all. And by that I mean the facilitator simply says, okay, who's got good ideas? Who has something to share? Let's hear it. And if you think about the brainstorming processes that you've been a part of, when you do it that way, and it doesn't have much in the way of rules, typically those folks who are the dominant voices in that process are the individuals who are the loudest, uh, the quickest thinkers, and I say quickest thinkers, that doesn't necessarily mean the best thinkers, right? They're the folks who are quick to articulate an idea, uh, tend to be the most verbal, the most verbally active, and they also tend to be the people with the most power, either formal or informal, in the room. So they're comfortable speaking. Many folks will wait until their boss has something to say, and then when their boss speaks, they kind of piggyback on that and extrapolate or extend that idea that the boss has already uh, shared because that's what they're comfortable doing because they're worried about saying something contrary. Uh, so, so these power dynamics and these issues of those who are most active or least active not participating adequately are some of the major problems in unstructured brainstorming. So there's this very simple and very common strategy, nominal group technique, 
NGT, which has four basic steps. And there are variants of how to do this, but sticking to these four steps is typically what gets people a nice result. And so I'm just going to walk you through those four steps. And if you use these, I think you'll find them very helpful. I will say as an aside, I, when I do nominal group technique, I can always tell the individuals who are the folks who usually benefit from the non-structured brainstorming because those are usually those kind of fast, powerful uh, speakers. And they don't tend to like to be um, contained by these rules, so you will have to watch that because they're the folks who usually are able to uh, influence the group with a lot of rapid uh, sort of strong output. The problem is they tend to dominate and we don't hear from the other folks and that's what's critical. We often miss out on some really valuable information from folks who feel less comfortable, they're a little slower to speak, they feel like they might have, they might have a little less confidence in terms of uh, sharing their ideas. So we have these four steps. First is silent generation of ideas. So you start with a good question, a strong question. And that can take some practice. There's a lot of good literature out there about how to develop good, good questions that are designed to help a, a team solve a problem. And then we have silent generated, a generation of ideas. So we have our folks around the table, typically between 8 to 10, 12 folks are, is a nice number for doing the nominal group technique. You can do it with a few, with fewer, 4 or 5, you can do it with 15, but I think 10 is about the nice average size for a really max, uh, maximum uh, productivity. So we have them just gen jot down their ideas on paper. Um, or on separate post-its. Sometimes you can use post-its, that's a nice strategy. And then after we've given them some time, silently, on their own, see what the, one of the things that happens when you do it silently is that they all generate unique and separate ideas rather than doing it collectively where everyone's ideas start to mush together and they kind of start to pile on to each other. We, if we do this silently, generate a whole wide array of ideas. If we have 10 people and each of them generate five ideas on paper, right out of the gate we've got 50 ideas. Obviously there'll be some redundancies, but we'll have a lot of ideas if we do it this way. And then we get to step two where we have them round robin report these ideas, meaning we just go around the circle and we say, okay, person number one, give me one idea. We don't have them give us all their ideas, just one at a time. Then we go to two for an idea and all the way around the circle. Then we start again, go around the circle again and keep going until all the ideas have been spoken and you can write them down on a big piece of paper or you can have them write them on post-its and you can put them up on the wall, all the post-its up on a wall. And so then you have all these ideas, and there's no discussion of them at that point. So it's not about saying yay or nay, good idea, bad idea. We're just trying to generate as many ideas as we can, which then takes us to step number three, where we discuss them for clarification. If any of the ideas are not understood by any of the people in the room, we ask the, uh, the, the person who generated the idea to explain it to us so that we do understand it so that it's clear. We might do a little bit of consolidation if some of the ideas are pretty much identical to each other, kind of pulling them together, but watch that you don't do too much of that because a lot of subtle differences can be lost if you start uh, kind of clumping all the ideas together. I've seen folks lose a lot of creative, unique uh, ideas by overly, trying to overly simplify the, uh, the big list. And then you move on to some version of voting, uh, where you really force a choice. And in that case, if you know if there's, uh, you don't want to, if there's 50 ideas on the board, we don't want to say vote for 20. That's not much of a choice. I like to get people down to voting for, you know, 10% like or less of the total generated content. Um, and there's different ways to vote. You can have, you know, multiple rounds of voting. You can vote by a show of hands. You can vote by having people put little dots on the board. You know, you can be creative in the way that you do this so that you're engaging the team members actively. Um, so then you, as you see the team process in this, we've got everybody very active in generating and participating and being part of voting and selecting, which then gets us moving toward a strong sense of consensus rather than a dictate from one single powerful person, hey, we need to do X. What we're doing here is we're building consensus with a team that's having this exploration and starting to then come up with priorities. And we've got this vast list of potential ideas which can then be mined in the future for projects to make improvements. So then when we get into doing PDSA cycles and thinking about strategies, here we've generated a great list of potential strategies uh, that can be employed uh, going forward. So if you spend an hour and a half with 10 people and do this process efficiently, the result, the output can be very, very useful for, uh, for the foreseeable future for you. So that's nominal group technique.
I want to talk with you a little bit about surveys. I like to use surveys a lot when I'm doing strategic planning with folks um, and when organizations are working on um, some, some quality improvement efforts. So one of the things that, that happens is that, you know, surveys do require a little bit of time on the front end. They require some analysis. And so people tend to do the kinds of surveys that are the easiest to manage. For example, they use Likert point scales. You know, on a scale of one to five, how do you feel about this? On a scale of one to five, um, is it a good idea to uh, to do this, to do this, to move forward in this direction? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I get a little concerned with too much emphasis on, on point scales because um, they are easy to process. So that's the good news. The bad news is finding out that the average um, score for uh, item X is 3.7 is not particularly actionable. So what does that mean? And we all know that with surveys, people tend to kind of skew often toward toward the high end in terms of services. And they often tend to like a whole bunch of stuff. So if you give them 10 things to vote on, they vote high on eight out of the 10 things. What have they really been able to prioritize with that voting? So I think it's often better to ask some questions that are a little bit more challenging, but I think a little bit more actionable when we see the results. For example, ask people to rank order things. Instead of giving them 10 items and asking them to vote on how they feel about each of those 10 items, ask them to rank order the 10 items, which one's most important and which one's least important. Um, that's a little bit harder for them. And it's a much more actionable set of data if you give this out to 20 staff members and then find out that, uh, most of them put a particular item in as one of their top three. That's very powerful. That item has some pull with that group. And then they, there was this other item that almost everybody put as an eight, nine, or a ten. Okay, so now we know where this team really is. If we just asked them to do five, you know, five point scales, they probably would have put a three or a four on those items that they put at the bottom of the list because no one likes to give anything a one because it has some value. Obviously, if it's a service you're doing. People aren't going to want to give it a one, but they might not think it's very important. And rank ordering pushes them to make that decision, which is very useful. I'm also a big fan of open-ended responses, although it takes time to process these. If you ask people clear questions and ask them for a comment response, then you can go through those and pull out those themes and then start to sort those themes and find some, find some very powerful trends. If you keep your uh, surveys relatively short and really work to engage your participants, you can have a nice turnout. I always like to keep telling people what percentage of the people have completed it. Say if there's 25 staff I'm trying to get to do a survey and I'm giving them a week to do it, you know, after two days I'll say, well, seven people did it. Thanks for doing it. You know, I hope the rest of you can get to this today. And then when they're halfway through, well, 30 of you have done it. So we're getting close. We're past the 50%. And that, that's a positive peer pressure. So you kind of have to keep on people and push them to try to get that highest response rate. I also encourage you to kind of keep track if you can. Use, use a tool like SurveyMonkey or other simple online tools. You can keep track of the categories of, of staff who are participating and, and got involved with the survey, survey. You can keep it anonymous, but you can also you know, have, it, have a, a way of defining if it's a, a board member or a management team member or a, a program staff member, et cetera. And in red on this slide, you'll see these three questions. <clears throat> For my money, uh, if I'm going to survey people and I, and I can only ask them three questions about something, these are the three open-ended questions that I will put on a survey. Like if I have people go to a training and I want to ask them about the training, I don't plug in five-point scales at the bottom to ask them to fill out 10 or 15 questions about the quality of the training. I ask them what was the best part of this training, what was the worst part of this training, and how can we fix the worst part? Because at the end of the day, those really are the most critical elements that we want to find out about. So as it relates to anything, what's the best part of this program? What's the worst part of this program? How can we fix the worst part? Those three questions are, for, for, from my perspective, really uh, gold when it comes to looking at improving your service delivery. So asking your clients those three questions, asking your staff those three questions in any kind of a survey format can be very, very powerful for you. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about measurement. Uh, so how do we measure our progress, understand how we're doing? Um, a lot of folks get struggle with measures, struggle with finding the resources to do measures, struggle with finding staff who have uh, familiarity with measurement. I like to talk about measurement as you see on the bullet, 
in quotes, counting stuff. Um, it's easy to get overly complicated with, with, measure, with measures and with data. What we're really doing is trying to find out what happened before we did something, what trends are going on over time. We're trying to count something. So whatever we're measuring, we need to keep it very simple and stripped down. It has to be practical. It has to be doable for us. I've seen many, many organizations try to do measures that are overly complicated, uh, that require too much staffing, uh, too much uh, resource in terms of uh, analytical skills that, that uh, staff might not have, and or just time in terms of managing complex data structures. So we want to think about simple existing resources. There's, there, are, there are measures that you may already have to record and report. Uh, for my money, I would much rather see an organization use a good measure that they can manage than a great measure which is not manageable because it doesn't matter how great a measure is. If you can't manage it, then you can't sustain it. It's not going to be workable for you and the, the output in terms of its ability to be a compass for you is, uh, is going to be minimal. So we want to be very practical and very humble in our assessment. What can we do realistically um, in terms of figuring out how to measure things? As you've heard from many folks, if you want to change something, measure it. You start observing, start counting, start keeping track. That will draw your attention, draw your team's attention. And that is the territory that you will you'll be impelled then to want to change because you will be aware of what's actually going on. Uh, so data then becomes the driver. Um, as, as I like to say, it's both, it's both the wind and the sails in terms of moving you forward and it's also the compass. So in any journey on improvement, if there is no, if there is not good data, um, then that's a non-starter. We can't go anywhere. Um, it is the uh, the gas in the tank. Sorry to mix metaphors, but it's uh, I can't state it clearly enough. The intention and the desire to improve and to change is one thing. Uh, clarity in terms of some form of measurement is the the critical element to move it forward. I also like to think about data within a context, and this. Uh, DIKW pyramid, data information, knowledge, wisdom. You see it in, in, in a number of industries and in, in folks who deal with information and data a lot. I think it's a really useful pyramid and I'd encourage you to think about it with me and to sort of think about the implications for you and your organization as it relates to data. Because sometimes folks just say, well, we just need to focus on data, we need data. Uh, you don't just need data. You know, data is 27. 27 is data. What does that mean? It's a discrete element, as indicated here. It doesn't mean anything, right? Now, you all know this. What we really want is linked elements which, which provide us with information. And above that, organized information which gives us knowledge and applied knowledge which gives us wisdom. Aspiring to wisdom may be a little bit grandiose for most of us. Probably thinking about getting good information which leads us toward knowledge is probably the category, the level of uh, information and knowledge that we want to aspire to. Here's another variant of how to think about that, right? So if we have information, we have, we're understanding the relationships between data points, right? And knowledge is about understanding patterns. So really knowledge is, uh, is, is critical for, for improving your services. We have to understand the patterns. What are the trends and patterns in our services based on the data that we have? This higher level wisdom, again, trying to aspire to that, that's understanding principles. So based on, uh, typically when someone's been trying to manage a, a program or an organization for 20 years, they might then get to this level of really understanding some core principles about how things work based upon having uh, analyzed and, un and reviewed those patterns over, over a longer period of time and at a level of depth. So when you think about this pyramid structure, thinking about trying to get to that place of knowledge where you understand the patterns. All of it, of course, starting with getting good data. It's necessary but far from sufficient in terms of understanding what's going on. All right, so all of that is prepped to get us to this space of the PDSA. As I said, there's a lot of work that you need to do to think about how you're doing, how you're getting ready for PDSA, gathering information to think about how you want to then make changes. So as many of you are familiar, we have plan, do, study, act cycles, right? So plan out a change project, right? What are the kind of questions? Planning out how we're going to 
carry out these actions, the who's going to do what, where, and when, right? Then we're going to do whatever it is that we planned, right? We're going to carry out this plan and document it, right? We have to have good data structures in place, as we've just been discussing, in order to document what's going on. And also observations in terms of some of the subjective elements or unexpected elements as we carry out this activity. And then we might start analyzing as we're doing it. And then we move into the study phase where we're actually digging in. As I said, some people call this plan do check act. I'm not a fan of calling it check because I think you need to do more than just check. You really do need to study. Let's look at our data. Let's kind of think about what we predicted might happen and what actually happened. Let's think about some of the other human factors that were involved, like, oh, gee, we did this project and we changed something, but then somebody was out on vacation or uh, there was a big uh, weather event or clients were pulled out of the service because of something else going on. And so that might impact our data. So let's kind of be thoughtful about what happened as we did this and do a thoughtful analysis and study. And then we get to the act phase of the PDSA. Um, do we, and there are three typical options in terms of this particular change that we implemented. If it didn't work out at all, we might want to abandon it. If it worked out to some degree, but there are some things that are concerning us, we might want to adapt it, sort of tweak it a little bit. If it worked out wonderfully, then we're going to adopt it and put it in place as our standard practice, right? So that is the, kind of the core PDSA model. Now, we see here in the second option that we might want to adapt, and there's that question, what changes are to be made in the next cycle? So the idea of multiple cycles is something that we want to talk a little bit about. And here's a graphic that will kind of show you that idea. Um, this notion of working your way up a hill by spinning this PDSA wheel through multiple cycles. In our example here, we have the issue of the number of clients who are showing up for intake sessions at a service, right? So we have a baseline period where we measure how we're doing in general. So the service is at about 50% in terms of show rate for those initial intake sessions. And then we implement a change. Let's say we start reminding people about their appointments, if it's an appointment-based service. And uh, based on that, we see that it went up quite a bit. Now then we, as this is one PDSA, right, through this three-week period. Now some PDSAs might be several weeks long, some might be several months long. That's a key question that comes up a lot. Um, the bigger the service, the more data you have, the more rapidly you might be able to, to implement a change cycle. A smaller service might need to take longer in order to get more data to really understand what's going on. But then at the end of the first cycle, as we said previously, we, might, we need to take action. We might tweak this and add another element to it. Maybe we'll call people plus we'll send out a letter to them if we're finding that we're not getting them by phone. Maybe we'll call people plus we'll um, do some other strategy to try to increase this rate. So in this case, we, were, we moved it up again, and we said that we got to about where we wanted to get. Let's say our goal was about 80, and then we move this into a sustainability phase where we put these practices, these changes that we made, and we made them in cycle one and cycle two, we made them then our standard operating procedure. That's how we do business now. So we said multiple cycles, again, to that graphic at the top of the page which lead us to our goal, and then we have to try to sustain that. And that's really kind of the core of how that PDSA works. All of this driven off of those initial strategies and those initial tools that I showed you, which were designed to get you to figuring out what the problem was, what you needed to do in order to, to implement some effective change strategies, picking those, those change strategies using some of those tools that we looked at, and then having the PDSA go to work for you and again, all with the team structure working to analyze the information as you moved it forward. So I said I wanted to wrap up in our last couple of minutes with you related to teams and to just talk with you uh, for a little bit about that. Um, as you see here, this is an African proverb I'm a fan of. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Very often I find that organizations want to go fast because they have a sense of urgency. Of course you do. You want to change things to improve. We have an environment right now that's rapidly changing in many ways. You want to move things along. There is a tendency to try to uh, go it alone in terms of a couple of key managers just saying we're going to do X. The worry for me is that if you don't engage your team, it's going to be hard for you to get very far because you're just going to be dragging them through the trail and you're going to be slogging your way and, and cutting this trail for yourself without the benefit of that team working uh, and helping you to get 
to make progress uh, in a challenging environment. So, um, so it's using some of those tools that, I, that I've been describing for you, all those tools are designed to engage that team, to get them motivated and focused. These are not things that take months. Most of those tools can be done in relatively short periods of time, an hour or two in a meeting here, uh, on a, a couple of hours in, at another environment pulling together a simple survey that people can fill out over the course of the next week. They're not, they're, they're not too laborious, they don't take too long, but they are critical in terms of giving you the full information and, and, and most importantly engaging, engaging that team as part of the process. Um, I like to talk about team as a verb as opposed to a noun. I've seen many, many organizations where people tell me uh, that they have a team or they, they show me the team or I sit down with the team and it's very quick, I very quickly uh, come to understand that it's a team in name only. You know, teaming is a verb, teaming is, is, an, is an action. Uh, it is, it is uh, the case when, it, when people are acting in a way that is team-oriented and, and pulling together effectively. So take a look at what you define as team and say, well, are we engaged in team activity? Because that's really the only measure that you can use when you're thinking about teams. Uh, I'm not a fan of standing committees. I'm not a fan of groups that meet because they meet. Um, you, pick a, you pick an issue, you pick a concern, you put together a team, and you say this group is tasked with a particular project to take a look at this issue and to move it forward uh, as best they can and to um, you know, get the support they need from the management team, from the management staff to help them um, with uh, any resources that they may be needing. But um, they do their work, and then when they're done, they're done. And then maybe we reconfigure and, and come up with another team. And if you're a small organization, that's okay. Maybe it's the same people on the team, but you keep the focus on the agenda, on the task, rather than just the kind of standing staff meeting approach, because that's where the energy comes from. It comes from the action. So that takes us to the end of uh, the material that I wanted to share with you. That was a pretty rapid tour through a bunch of strategies and tools related to process improvement, quality improvement with the Land Use Study Act is kind of at the hub. And so now we have about 10 or 12 minutes. And uh, Danielle, I want to touch base with you and see if we have any questions generated already or if uh, folks want to generate them now. Thanks, Matt. So, yeah, we don't have any questions quite yet. I actually just sent a message out to everyone, um, encouraging folks to use the chat box. So we do have about 10 minutes, um, and I know you presented a ton of information, which was really helpful. Um, so hopefully folks will have some questions. We'll give them a minute or two to start typing in um, and then get to some Q&A. Great. So Matt, one question um, we have is, you know, you presented a lot of different kinds of tools. Um, is there any one that you would recommend over another one? Um, how would you? Yeah, that's good. Um, I I I tend to I tend to um, I gave the kind of core what I would say are the kind of core elements that I find to be most effective. I think that the best uh, the best uh, way to decide which one works for you. One is to experiment with them a little bit. Some of them can, can do kind of the same, same, same thing. For example, if you do that cause and effect diagram, you might find that that might have the same uh, impact as uh, a uh, nominal group technique. Um, the choice of the specific tool is usually kind of individualized, and that's usually where I like to talk with organizations um, and kind of dial in kind of where in the stage they're at. If they have, a, if they already have a defined, clear problem, um, and they're just looking for for ideas, then the nominal group technique, for example, might be where they need to go. If they're just kind of confused and kind of lost, like what is going on here, you know, then maybe a walkthrough is a good is a good approach, or flow charting to really get a sense of what are we doing. We have no idea where the problems are. So it kind of depends on where they're at. But any of these is a good starting point because any of them will generate a bunch of ideas. Um, and you can then say, well, are, 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 is there another of these tools that might help me? 
my, my encouragement is for people to just start doing them. The investment in doing them is relatively simple. Take an hour of a staff meeting and do one of them and um, see what you think. Um, some groups tend to lean toward one or another, but I, I think they're, it's mostly about doing a little experimentation. Great, thank you. Um, someone typed in, um, can you please give us an example of where you've used data to make changes and improvements to a process? Sure. Well, uh, I might say, and I'm not being sarcastic, I might say, where, where would you not use it? The only way we know where we're going is if we have some data. So if my, my simple example in the slide that I used for the PDSA was, let me pull that slide back up, right, whoops, sorry, one too many. Was, um, was, was a show rate issue, right? Um, I've been to plenty of change team meetings where the meeting gets together and let's say they're working on trying to increase the percentage of people who show for services and the first question is, so how are we doing? And the person who's responsible for the data says, well, the data doesn't quite make sense because th these numbers, I can't really interpret them. And so then I would ask you, what does that change team then talk about? They really can't do anything because they, that's their eyes. That's like now they're in the dark because they implemented a change and they don't have good data. They don't know whether or not it impacted anything. They really have nothing to do now. So every time you want to change something, you have to ask yourself, how are we going to know if this change is an improvement? And the only way you're going to know is if you have some data, some measure that shows that it's an improvement. Um, so it, it, it's, it's everything to a change project. It's the only thing that you, that you, can, that you can't have at the table. Um, it's got to be there. There's some other pieces that you might be able to, to, to manage to, to, to not have at the table, but that's got to be there. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of my, uh, hopefully that's, that's an answer. That it's not exactly answering the question, but, uh, but, but every change you want to make. And think about the kinds of things that you need to change. We need to get better at, well, how are you going to know if you got better at it? That's the problem that a lot of organizations have is that they just start launching into changes, but they really haven't figured out how they're going to know if it makes an improvement or not. So it's a simple question, how do you know if a change is an improvement? But underneath that simple question is a really core discipline, which is you have to find out how you're going to measure that before you can change it. Otherwise, your change efforts will be um, wasted efforts because we won't know if it worked. Similarly, if people change three or four things at a time, the whole idea of the PDSA is that you change one thing at a time. Sort of like in high school uh, biology class when you learned about the scientific method, right? You know, you don't add three chemicals into the mix and see what happens. You just add one chemical in. Uh, now I switched to chemistry class, sorry. Scientific method with, in whatever class you're taking. Um, one thing at a time, and then we measure it and see if it changed something. Then we add something else and see if it changed something. Right, so every time focusing on a measure. Okay, so we have a couple more questions, and one of the, these questions actually piggybacks on what you were just talking about. Um, it's related to the PDSA cycles. Um, is there a specific length of time that's best suited for PDSA cycles, or can they be used for more long-term projects? That's a good, a good question. Uh, a simple example I like to use. If you are Macy's department store in New York City, and you run a certain kind of a sale on Saturdays. Now, Macy's department store has huge amounts of data, and they know how many people come in the door you know, every quarter hour, throughout the day, throughout the week. And so if they run a certain kind of a sale, they will know if it generated more foot traffic into the store very quickly, like the first day they run it, right? Because the volume of data, you know, they know X number of people, and it's a big X, the number of people who come into that store. Contrast that with a tiny little boutique in a small town that maybe gets three or four customers on a typical Friday. If they run a sale, and on that first day they run the sale, they get uh, five or six customers instead of three or four, did that, did that sale really cause that to go up? It's hard to know because the volume is so small. That might have just been a, an, an, you know, a little bit of a blip, a little increase that just happened uh, by chance. So they're going to have to run that sale for a number of weeks. And if they do it for a number of weeks, if they consistently have several more customers coming in, then that's probably going to be an indication 
that it is impacting their customers, the volume of customers. So big volume services can get enough data to get a sense of trends really quickly. Smaller volume services need to take longer to really get a sense of a trend. So you have to kind of dial that in based on your team's analysis and maybe getting some external support as well to kind of sort that out. You know, does this change really indicate, uh, 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 is it a significant change? Now there's a lot of statistical analysis that can be done, but I think just intuitively uh, and simply you can just kind of look at that with your team and say, is this just by chance or does this really seem to correlate with what we've done here? And the bigger your services, the quicker the, the quicker you can do that analysis. Hopefully that, that's helpful. So small services take a little longer. And so something that spreads out over four, six, eight, ten weeks is good. Something that gets beyond, say, two or three months, I think starts to work away from a rapid cycle model. I like to think of rapid cycle within these, say, three or four weeks or maximum of about two months or two months plus. If you're getting longer than that, then it's it's kind of moving away from the spirit of the rapid cycle approach. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm not sure this is a, a short answered question, um, but can you talk a little bit more about um, the SOAR model and how you use it? Uh, the SOAR, okay, sure. Yeah, uh, typically, um, in my experience lately, I, I, I often will use the standard SWOT, uh, as I said, with the weaknesses and threats, but the, I will flip to a SOAR if I'm working with people who may have not done much in the way of strategic planning before and who might feel a little bit uh, demoralized when they start thinking about those serious weaknesses. Most people who are in managerial positions and have been in those positions for any length of time have been forced to deal with some of those really hard, challenging issues and to confront, you know, difficult budgets or, or other challenges that might make it hard for their organization to be effective. And many of them have had to deal with worries about sustaining programs, whether or not they'd even be able to keep a service active. Um, so they're usually okay with looking at weaknesses and threats. Some staff who have haven't done that work, if they're members of the team, sometimes they get demoralized, and if they get too demoralized, then they kind of get paralyzed by that, and they're less active and less motivated. So with those folks, I'll, sw I'll switch to the SOAR, and then I'll work through those kind of questions because they really are motivational and inspirational. And so they're very positive and focused, and they create good energy. Um, if, a, if a team is lacking in confidence, lacking in uh, and maybe a little bit worried about the future, then I will use those SOAR tools. And you can go online and, and Google those and find uh, some nice, there's some actually some nice books, brief books about uh, SOAR questions, which list some nice questions that you can use uh, using those uh, sort of sub-questions under those main questions that I gave you. There's like dozens of other questions in those categories that can help you to uh, motivate staff as you're doing that analysis. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, and it looks like we're just about out of time. Um, so I do want to thank you, Matt, so much for your presentation today. You've given folks so much to think about and lots of information, so hopefully everyone will uh, take this info back to your teams and start doing some rapid cycle change practices. Great. Uh, thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure talking with all of you. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much.